Welcome to episode 258 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing UK producer Dean Fisher. He's produced, been producing movies since the early 2000s. He started off doing short films and has now produced nearly a dozen feature films over the last decade or so. We're going to talk about the early days of his career when he was doing these short films and then also get into his latest film, The Bromley Boys, which is a coming-of-age comedy and how that project came together. So stay tuned for that interview. Also at the end of this episode, I'm going to do a run-through of my own projects and give some updates on all of those projects just so you can kind of keep up to date with what I'm doing. So stay tuned for that as well. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 258. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing UK producer Dean Fisher. Here is the interview. Welcome Dean to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. You're more than welcome. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Well, um, my background is I'm from the UK. I'm an English uh, film producer. I've been producing now for 20 years, so I've been around the block a little bit. Um, basically, I started um, as an actor um, and went to drama school and um, thought I would be the best actor in the world. And, and you know, you come out of drama school, you start getting a few parts and you're thinking you're brilliant. And then what happens is they dry up. Um, and then you, you, you think the world's against you. So I started to produce films initially to, to get myself better parts. And then what was happening was I actually really enjoyed the the mechanics of producing and, and, and pulling it off against all the odds and, you know, never have enough money and trying to do all the deals and everything that, that, that's involved with producing. And, and after a while, I thought, actually, I want better actors than me. So... And in the end, I wouldn't put myself in my own films. And I thought, if I'm not going to put myself in my own films, who else is going to? And so it was just a natural thing to to stop acting and, and focus on producing. And you know, it's 20 years later, I'm still doing it. And um, basically, I also did a lot of fringe uh, theatre shows, so um, small theatre shows. And, but film was always my passion. And it's something that I've always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Spent about seven or eight years making short films, which is a long time to make short films because you don't make any money at it. But it's a great way of learning your trade. And I really didn't want to make big sta- mistakes when I moved into features. So I really wanted to spend the time um, getting the mistakes out. Let's talk about no, the no. short films. Just for just a minute, let's talk about the short films. Um, I'm curious, um, maybe you can talk about just, like you, you said you didn't want to make mistakes on the feature, so you spent a lot of time in these short films. Maybe just talk briefly about um, how those short films prepared you for a feature. What were those mistakes and, and what was the benefit? And did any of them lead directly to a feature film? Like, did one of them take off and that got you financing for your feature film? Uh, maybe just walk yeah. through some of the, how well, did the short films help you? Well, well, to be honest, um, just just um, what I was about to say was um, now, in hindsight, probably what I spent on my last short film, I could have made a small feature film for. Um, and actually, I, I just watched a, a feature film which was made for a lot less than that last night and was very impressive. Huh. Uh, um, so, I mean, the reason um, why, you, why I wanted to not make the mistakes, see, Short film production is a, is really a it's a learning tool. You want to learn, and and the sort of mistakes you'll make is that 
you know, first few films are terrible. Generally, they are because you don't really know what you're doing. I didn't go to drama school or anything like that. Uh, sorry, not drama school. I didn't go to um, film school. So, you know, I, I learned through making films and, and getting my mistakes. So sometimes, you, you know, you would try and do everything yourself. You'd build the sets and, and, and try and do too much. And, and you really, after a while, I realized that I need to get people in their own disciplines um, you know that you need a, a production designer that just focuses on the art department and all that side. You need a, a cinematographer to come in and focus on that. And and then it's a case of getting better scripts, stronger ideas. Um, you know, a lot of my short films were made on film, so it gives mm. you the discipline that you can't waste loads of takes because 35 mil was very expensive, um, not just for the stock. But then the lab costs and then all the processing and everything else. So, you know, that was a reason why I think short films really helped. And, and obviously that was just before all the red cameras and, and, and the digital era went crazy. But now I would say I would, if I go back in time, the last short film I did was a film called 10 Minutes, um, which I wrote and produced and financed myself. Um, which was a crazy thing to do because there's no way that was ever going to make money. But it, you know, went to 22 international film festivals. It picked up awards, um, and it really, at that point, said to me, "Right, I'm ready to make that transition." But if I was going to go back um, and start again, I would do probably about four or five short films. I wouldn't make as many, um, and then the last one will be a short version of a feature film that I would eventually want to make because then that be can become your marketing tool to raise the finance of the feature film so you can prove that it's working in a short form and that will basically give investors more of a an idea on what you're trying to do and what I've learned over the years is that investors can be a bit lazy you know they're not so much lazy that they're, they're busy people mm -hmm. and and the reason why they're so successful and have surplus money to invest in things is because, you know, they've been very successful and busy at, at doing that certain trade. So you, you, you've only got a small window to hit them, and not a lot of people want to sit and read scripts straight away. So if they can watch a five- or ten-minute video, um, which is a short version of that feature film, then I think that gives you so much more of a calling card to, mm -hmm. to, um, to prove that this could work in a long form. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's interesting, and I want to point that out to the listeners. You just said you made a bunch of shorts, and now if you went back, you would do maybe four or five shorts. I think a lot of people, they want to go too quickly, and they're thinking, oh, I'll do one short and then a feature. And even, you know, after all this experience, you still think four or five shorts is probably a good number. It's not just do one short and then jump to the feature. There's still a learning curve there. No, there is. And um, the, the problems you face um, when you go into feature films is – you know, there's different sides to the business. So when I say mistakes, one is not knowing your market and having a clear route to your market and, and knowing where your audience is. You know, it's no point just making a film for film's sake, you know, because some people say, oh, I just want to make a movie and everyone's going to love it. But but you've got an audience. So if or, or you've got to find your audience and, and that's becoming more and more harder now to find that audience. So, um, you know, in feature film world, I would probably be more selective on, on the types of projects that you try and do. Certainly your first ones, because you really got to make a mark. I mean, my first feature film, we made still for really low money. It was made for about $70,000. Um, but it was a simple idea. We shot it over four weeks. Um, it was a profit share, so no one really got paid. But then our first deal was um, for the same sort of money, about $70,000. Um, to a, a big American company and then we got a sales agent on board and, and you know it started to do loads of deals but if I hadn't had that experience with short films and selling the short films I think I would have blown a lot more money on, on, on a feature and you know when the budgets get bigger and the stakes get higher then you've got a lot of people's invest you know that, that harder money invested into the film it doesn't guarantee it's still going to make a return be successful but you want to give it the best shot you know mm -hmm. us as filmmakers is trying to get the best ingredients we can together 
to make sure that that film has a chance to become a hit. Yeah. And was that movie, was that Night Junkies, that first one you're talking that about? That was Night Junkies, yeah. And how did you raise the $70,000? Where where did that money come from? It came from um, the director to see my last short film. Um, I also did like a, a, like a, a documentary on how we made that short film, just um, when it wasn't like a how we made it, it was basically show all the processes of what we went through, uh, all the way from the lab, and everyone got interviewed all the way along the line. So, so there was a full story, so someone could watch that and say, "All right, I don't agree with what you've done, or you've done a terrible job there, or I didn't like this part of your film." But it just showed the full and, and care and attention of, of what went into the process of making that film. Um, and funny enough. Um, someone that I'm working with now who was one of the actresses in that and now she's producing with me but but in in terms of um uh the director so he um saw that and he, he lived locally and he said look I've got this ambition I want to make a feature film before I'm 30 I've got some money and my boss has got some money and, you know together we've got this 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 budget and and here's a script and I looked at it and it was an interesting idea. It was basically a vampire thriller, but but rather than being so much vampires, they were junkies, and their addiction was blood rather than um, heroin or mm-hmm. or cocaine. You know, uh, you know. So so their addiction was blood, and and they was always trying to get that fix, and and so that that was the, the interesting thing. So it was quite, it was you know, a bit of heavy drama in, in times, but but I think it worked quite well for that type of budget. And then that led us on to my next film, which was City Rats, which that was, um, you got two actors in this country that was doing very well at that time, uh, an actor called Danny Dyer and Tamar Hassan. Um, and that film basically was really like a magnolia, like four stories, very dark stories. But when we sold it to the distributor, because it had those two actors, they just sold it as a gangster film. Because uh, one of the stories was gangsterish, and they thought, okay, well, gangsters the biggest uh, market, and and those two actors were associated with that, and it did really well. It went to number three in the charts. Hmm. We sold nearly four hundred thousand DVDs, um, and you know that really helped my career, because um, then then you would get meetings with everyone because they wanted to know what was next, um, you know, and sometimes. You know, it, it takes a film like that and that sort of success story to, you know, to, to push you along the ladder. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. And, you know, that, that was the, the base of my career then. So let's dig into um, The Bromley Boys, your latest feature film. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick pitch or logline. What is The Bromley Boys all about? Um, Bromley Boys was a labor of love as a project. It took seven years to get off the ground. Um, and many times we thought this is never going to happen. But it was originally a book. Um, written by someone called Dave Roberts, and the the book um, was a sweet story, but it, you know it didn't really translate to a film. So we got in a writer called Warren Dudley, and um, and basically it's a, a coming of age comedy. I hate saying that coming of age because everyone thinks, oh, that's not marketable, but it is. It's a kid who becomes obsessed with this team called Bromley FC, and Bromley FC who are a soccer team in the UK. Um, they, at that time, were the worst team in the land mm-hmm. and they couldn't win to love nor money. And, you know, he's addicted to them um, um, and he knows everything about the players, um, what they eat for breakfast, you know, every intricate detail. And, um, you know, he, he keeps on being let down by the team. And basically, it, it, this was set in 1969-70. So we've got all the classic cars and... Um, you know, and, and really pulled off that era quite well. But but he becomes more and more obsessed with the team, and, and and basically they're about to go out of business because the chairman has been gambling all their assets away. And um, you know, if they don't win the last game of the season, they will go down, and not only go down, they'll also go out of business. So he gets the chairman to gamble his Aston Martin, which is now it's worth a million pounds, but then it would have been worth quite a bit so he gets him to sell his car and gamble it on that last match and he becomes the coach and manages the game and then obviously if they win then then the club survive and and they get to fight another season so yeah yeah um, how did you get involved with this project um maybe take us through that um that journey 
Well, every project I get involved in it has different reasons. Sometimes it's something that I have commissioned as a script from um, from an idea, um, and then sometimes it's you know a screenplay that I've seen and, and managed to get the finance. And, and this scenario, another producer was introduced to me um, who had optioned the book, but he'd never really produced a film. He was an actor uh, producer, and so he asked me to come on board um, and, and steer him through it because he'd never been through that journey. So that, that's why I, I, I came on board. But to be honest, he was the one that was instrumental in getting the finance together. Um, you know, it was always his passion project. And then I was always there to offer support along the way. And then, um, you know, any documentation he needed for investors and things like that. So I was very helpful on that side. And then basically, um, after seven years, he said, I might have the money. I went, OK. And and then the journey started really, and and we didn't, he said we had the money, and then he believed he had the money, but then he only had a quarter uh, because the investor didn't deliver what they were supposed to. Um, but then we just we were on that journey then, and and you know we we instructed some brokers to to help raise the money, and and we, you know we got to a point where we worked out we had enough to get to the end of the shoot, um, but then that wasn't going to cover posts, so, but. We weren't going to get paid at that point until we could actually get the rest of the budget together. So it was a bit of a risk, mm-hmm. but but we knew as soon as we had something to show people, then then that would help get the rest of the money, and it did. So we cut a promo out of the shoot. Uh, that went to investors, and the rest of the money came in very, very quickly after that because then everyone could see that it was a strong idea and a strong project, um, and you know it made it a lot easier for us. So then we got the rest of the budget. Um, and, and that's just essentially how I came on board. And that's a long yeah. answer, but what, what, no, what did you like about the script or the book? Um, maybe you can talk about that a little, little bit. This podcast is for screenwriters, so maybe there's just some sort of things you can point out that these were the strong elements in this particular story. Um, might be helpful. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I, I never read the book. Okay. And I still haven't to this day, and I'm really bad because considering how. Um, you know, I'm actually quite friendly with the writer of the book. Um, but it was my other producer, TJ, um, got involved and, uh, and brought on board the writer to do the initial draft. And I only came on board after the, the first draft was done. But why I liked it and, and what I saw from it as a producer, sometimes, um, you know, certainly from a producing point of view, you have to identify with that story because you're going to have to fight for it for a long time you know it's not just um getting the finance and and that is ahead of a journey as it is and then you obviously got to go through production and then trying to sell it and you're kind of the parent of that project for the rest of its life so um you know you've got to spend a long time so you've got to really love it so i saw myself in the lead character um because it's about a kid that falls in love with soccer and i did that my grandfather used to take me to see a team called arsenal um, who's quite big in, in the Premier League now. Um, although I don't support them, I actually support a team called West Ham. But that, that was me as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could see myself how he fell in love with the team and then, um, you know, how you want to know every detail about all the players and so on. So it's basically, I think everyone could identify. And it's, it, it wasn't just soccer because you could fall in love with a major league baseball team or, or, you know, one of the minor leagues and, and become obsessed with them. So it's just that, that kind of fandom thing, isn't it, of, of falling in love. And, and that's what I, I identify with. And I thought a lot of people in the audience would. Yeah, yeah. So flip that around. You mentioned that sometimes you will get a screenplay and you'll option a screenplay. So you must be reading a lot of scripts. Maybe flip that uh, flip that question on its head. Are there some things you see that writers do that really turn you off? Things that as a producer, um, you think, man, the writer really should should not do this or not do that. Maybe you can give a couple tips in that direction. It's difficult because I, initially I used to read a lot more screenplays than I do now. Um, and I, I just went to LA for the AFM and probably read about four or five on the way to LA. Um, I was too tired to, on the way back, but that's, I don't get that much time to read because I spend most of my time actually making films mm-hmm. um, or, or trying to finance the ones you've got. So I rarely now at this point um, actually read many scripts. So they generally now come from other people that I, I know 
so other producers that recommend them to me so in a way it's um they've been screened first of all so someone's read it fell in love with it and then said oh you've got to read the script and that's generally how i i look at most scripts i generally get probably two to three scripts a week unsolicited um and um and I just don't have time to read them, and I, I still respond to everyone nicely. But, but the thing is, we can only make so many films um, at a time. You know, we probably spin probably eight to ten films at one time. Um, and, and when you're in production, you've got no time to do anything else because it just takes over your life. Mm. Um, and then when you come out of production, then you're, you're trying to get your the rest of your slate off the ground. So. Um, I'd say for a writer's point of view, it's difficult because you say, okay, well, how do I get these scripts under your nose? And, um, you know, sometimes agents will email me and say, I've got a really good script. Would you be interested? But, but really as an independent producer, I'm not a massive production company. So I've got tons of script readers. I have to do most things myself. So I will not probably read, or, or accept many scripts. I did at one point, and uh, and then people are hassling me saying, "Have I read them?" And you just don't get that much time. Yeah, yeah. I think that's um, actually how we met. I think I pitched you a script. Um, but I read ago. yours. I did read yours, and, yeah, and yeah. I really liked it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but I know you. Thing is, you you're quite. Um, uh, for many times, I was getting regular emails from you saying, "Look at my scripts. Look at my scripts." So I couldn't ignore you after a while because you wasn't. <laughs> you kept on putting them under my nose. So. I mean, persistence does obviously help, and I get that, but I suppose it just depends on the producer's situation. I mean, every producer's different, and they have a different remit, and some are specialising in horror or have got different things. And, and myself, at the moment, because of um, the, you know the, the current film that I'm producing now, plus I'm starting um, to shoot a, a short film version of a feature. I mean, I haven't made a short film for... About 15 years now, um, and um, and now I'm going back to do one, but only because it's a it's a short film version of a feature that we're trying to finance. So then the finance has got something to to you know work with and and, and show to their investors. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's um, so let's just talk about Bromley Brothers. Back to that again. I'm curious. One is sort of the. Um, just general screenwriting advice is to avoid period pieces um, because they're typically expensive to do um, and the, you know the market is somewhat limited maybe you can speak to that a little bit with Bromley boys um, yeah well you know I suppose people are fearful of, of periods but to be honest having done it I actually found it quite a pleasure I like challenges so you know to try and get 1960s London 1960s 70s London it is a challenge because, you know, a lot of buildings are modern. They've all got satellite dishes out the front of them now mm -hmm. or alarm boxes. So, you know, it's very different. And then when you're on the street, you've got loads of modern cars. So, you, you, you know, you have to place your old cars in front of the new cars to block them out because uh, you can't afford to shut down the streets and things like that. But really, if you had the budget, that's what you do. But we still did it on a relatively low budget. Um, uh, we had a lot of car collectors give out us the cars for free. A couple of our investors had some very flash cars, like the Aston Martin I mentioned was about a million pounds. It's now worth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I didn't enjoy driving that at all because he just gave us the car and said, there you go, it's yours for the next few weeks. And I'm like, okay. Um, but, but driving around on a million pound car you think would be really nice but the insurance alone would have wiped our film out if we had one knock on that so mm -hmm. I didn't really um, enjoy that but so cars are, are one of the things you can get loads of um, uh, you know collectors then costumes can be expensive because you've got to hire a lot more than, than you normally would mm -hmm. um, but, but you know there are vintage places that you can go to and still mm -hmm get away with it um and then um the other thing is we had to probably spend a bit more in post because whenever a modern element like alarm box appears in your shot you have to paint that out so mm -hmm. but, but I, I still think we got a lot for our budget um and we spent a lot of time finding the locations 
um, because it's period, you want to spend a bit longer finding the ones that could work for that era. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it worked, but also it worked with the story that we had. Um, you know, if it was a, a film in central London, it wouldn't work because all the buildings are so modern now. You know, you'd have mm-hmm. to find really specific areas of London, and, and that would be harder because it's, it's a mix between new and old. So you're a bit more limited on where you could go. You're better off going to another city, which is probably a bit less developed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm curious too, um, another big thing, sort of just general advice is cast. I mean, you had a really good cast for this film, but I wouldn't necessarily say you had big names in it. Um, how much did they, do you think that affected uh, or is going to affect your, your marketing and distribution? Um, well, cast is essential, and, and the way the market's becoming tougher and tougher, distributors generally want um, films with massive A-list casts, and they want to pay next to nothing for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, that's not the way the business works. You know, you can't make a film for nothing and have Tom Cruise in it. Mm-hmm. But but we, uh, for our budget, we had a cast that was known in the UK. Okay. Um, you know, there was a, a lady called Martine McCutcheon who was quite big in the UK at one time. She was in a film called Love Actually, um, which sure. I believe was very successful as well. And she had yeah. quite a leading role, but but she took some time out because she wasn't well for a while. So she still carried some weight, but but she's not a big star internationally, and, and that probably affected us internationally. Then we had another name um, in the UK, someone called Alan Davis, who's quite known. And he can get on big TV shows like Graham Norton, which is like 14 million views and, and is quite well known worldwide. Um, so, but we wasn't paying massive amounts. I can't obviously specify exactly what we paid them, mm-hmm. but but they, they were the right sort of level of casting for that budget. Um, if I was going to go back, and, and this is why a lot of British films don't travel as well, you know, we really, you want that American TV name um, that that helps sell the film because mm-hmm. um, you know you can go around any market like Cannes, Berlin, or, or the American film market, and you'll see who's selling because you'll see their poster up about six, well their name on about six or seven posters, um, and you know they're working at the time. I mean, I worked with and that's called Luke Goss on a film called Interview a Hitman, and at that time he was everything he was in was doing extremely well. And, and we did really well with it because, you know, he was current at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem sometimes is a lot of actors end up doing too many films. And then if they don't do as well, then their, their value drops quickly. And then you, you've got to really keep an eye on that because you could go to a sales agent and go, oh, I've got Luke Goss. And they go, oh, no, Luke Goss was, was out a year ago. Um, and, and this person's in now. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so difficult. It really is. It's not that they're, you know they're any worse actor because you know Luke's an amazing actor, mm-hmm. but but that's what can happen a lot with um, with actors that they can change and then they'd be back in again in, in six months time. Uh-huh. And I'm curious. You just said you really have to keep an eye on this. How do you actually keep an eye on this? How do you tell what are the actors that are going to be hot in six months or a year when you're done your film? It's difficult. It's one of those crystal balls that you can never tell because when you're casting your film. Um, it could take six months before you finish it. Um, so what I generally try and do is go to every market, every major market. So the, the three key markets is Cannes, Berlin, American film market. And it's expensive to go around to those markets. But, but you're, by going around the marketplace, you'll see the posters um, and what's up there. And if you can't afford to go to the markets and subscribe to like a screen or variety where you see all the posters that are being advertised because they spent all the um, sales agents will spend a lot of money advertising their titles to get it under the distributors noses so they can mm-hmm. sell their their films so by subscribing to screen around the market time you end up getting the dailies and that's where you see a lot of posters um and all the information of who's at the uh, what films are at the market is also available mm-hmm. um and you can see who's in it and, and that will give you an idea and also maybe speak to sales agents. Some are approachable and, and try and befriend one because they might tell you who's working for them. But remember, a sales agent can only take on so many films at a time. So it's worth speaking to about three or four because 
if they work with that actor, they know exactly how well that film's done before and what the value was. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it feels like to me, as sort of the filmmaker, um, when I've tried to engage sales agents, distributors, it feels like that a lot, like the, the the value of the actors is sort of their proprietary information. And so a lot of times they're not always that interested in sharing it with you or anybody else because that's sort of the secret sauce of what they're doing. So I lost that. Sorry, you, you broke up. So I said that again. Yeah, I'm saying when, when I've tried to engage sales agents or distributors um, trying to find out, well, who are the actors that you recommend? It feels like that that's sort of their proprietary information and they're not always that eager to share that. Um, it depends on how friendly they are. And if, they've, if you've got something that they want, then they will be a bit more mm-hmm. free with the information. But sure. I understand they've got to protect. Uh, the problem is sales agents now, uh, and you know they would admit it themselves. I think in in a few years' time you'll probably see hardly any in the marketplace. There's obviously some that that pop up and 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 will, will you you get new companies every market. But because filmmakers can go direct to the platforms or, or go to an aggregator directly, and you, you thing with sales agent and the way that it works, you have to give them. Um, your film and then they will take it to the market they will put a cost a marketing cost of going to the market attributed to your film that could be fifty thousand dollars plus um you know sometimes they will, well there, there'll be other fees on top of that that don't fall into that remit then you've got that commission on top and so it could be about 70 or eighty thousand dollars your film needs to take before you the filmmaker ever see a penny so um, that's and, and they will take on four or five films a market and, and work on the basis that those films keep them in business. But now even some films are not set in many territories at all, and so they're not even covering that that fee that keeps them going. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as a filmmaker, I think the sales agent system at the moment is flawed. Unless you've got a big cast, you know, like with big big names that everyone knows. Um, and, and you're making your films for five or six million plus, then then I, I can see the value in the sales agent because they, they can pre-sell to all the major studios. But if you're doing the lower budget stuff, I, I, I don't think I could advise going to one. Um, you know, there's only a few territories at the moment that are paying good MGs. And so if you can try and subscribe to Shenando and try and do those deals in those territories yourself, that would be better advised, um, and then go to a, a, a Bitmax or a distributor or, or you know indie rights or someone like that mm-hmm. that has um, direct relationships with the platforms aggregators, and you'll see more of a lion's share that way. Um, yeah. You know, you're, you're just cutting out the middle people, and a lot of sales agents now they're also doing the same thing. You know, that they're, they're going to those type of companies. Um, and taking that commission on top of that. So um, it, it's a changing landscape and, and no one knows the way it's going to go. Mm-hmm. But but I could see the sales agents eventually falling out of the marketplace. Yeah, for sure. So how can people see the Bromley Boys? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like um, in the U.S. and elsewhere? Um, well, we still haven't tied up a U.S. deal. In the U.K., we've done very well. We did a... Um, um, we, we basically put it out to all the, the major studios and everyone said a really lovely film but but can't don't know where they're going to place it and so on and always you get those list of negatives um, and, and very rare that people say right I'm going to take a chance on this so we decided to raise the money for the um, what you call prints and advertising to market the film um, ourselves and so we did a theatrical release which involved going into conventional cinemas and, and, and into about 50 or 60 screens um, and then having a big premiere which we had at Wembley Stadium so that when we got loads of press off of that and then after that we um, then put it into football stadiums, football clubs, communities um, and did quite a big theatrical campaign and, and funny enough we were up for a Screen International Awards um, against all the major studios that turned down our film. Nice. Um, and that's tomorrow night. Um, you, probably the time this will play, that will be long gone and we were lost already. But to be honest, I'm not really worried about losing. I mean, mm-hmm. Screen International Awards 
are the, the, the big awards for distributors in, in the UK. And so just to be nominated alongside the people that turned you down, I think is an, a, yeah. an award in itself. So I'm, I'm yeah, quite yeah, happy so, with that. Yeah, but but so, yeah, so basically we did the theatrical ourselves. Um, we got a cinema booker, hired a PR agency um, to work closely with us and, and, um, and, you know, did all the marketing ourselves. And, you know, I learned so much from that experience. Would I go and do that again? Yes. yes, but probably different for each film. I think you have to create a different strategy for each film. It's unique to that film and, and give a reason why people go to the cinema and um, spend their money. So in the US, we've got about five or six deals on the table. No one's offering big money for the rights. So then you're looking at what they're going to do for your film. Um, you know, what type of campaign going to run for the film we're at the moment just deciding what is the right deal and we're kind of going through an interview process of, of interviewing the um the distribution companies because there's gonna be a lot of trust if they're not paying money up front as a license fee then then you've got to make sure that they're going to pay you and report properly because it's no point doing all this work and then giving someone a film for nothing virtually yeah. Um, and it's still there's a lot of cost because you've got to deliver all the items that they need, you know, the hard drives and everything else, um, and then not see a penny out of it. So, or, or, or cent in your world. But so at the moment, that's what we're looking at. But there, there's a chance one of the companies is talking about doing a theatrical, so going out in LA in about three or four screens and then rolling it into different cities. Um, you know, and obviously as a filmmaker, and our ego always says, oh, cinema. But that might not best be the best deal for revenue-wise for the film. So we're just trying to work out which one it will be. And then the idea is to try and get it out probably about April time, March, okay. April. Okay, perfect, perfect. 2019. What, perfect. What's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, Twitter, Facebook, a blog, a website, anything you're comfortable sharing, I'll round up for the show notes. <laughs> I am. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely useless, to be honest, on, on <laughs> social media. Um, okay. and, and my website's about three years out of date. Probably hasn't got the last three films I made on there. Okay. Um, I do need to get better at it. But the thing is, yeah. you've got to work out what a website is for you. I mean, if it was to attract investors, then really I should make it a bit more slick, and I, I just haven't had time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so the website's probably not the best. It's got basic information about my older titles but we've moved on quite a lot since then and, and done quite a few more things so maybe once the website's updated that's a good way um i am on facebook um and i do definitely use facebook more for work not, not for personal um and twitter never on there really um just it's another thing that takes time isn't it um mm -hmm. And time is a battle at the moment. You know, you could work 14 to 16 hours a day sometimes. So I, I, I wish I could be more proactive and, and mm -hmm. be on these social media sites more. But I'm not afraid. Hang on, Perfect. sorry, there's someone else entering my house at this time. It's, no it's, it's coming home from work time now. No worries. And do you want to pitch your um, your um, AVOD platform that's going to be launching in January as well? We I'd can love talk to. about that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, tell us a little bit about that. Um, yes. Yeah, so basically, um, there's a new platform which we've been developing for the last couple of years. It's called Film Ahoy. Um, so in essence, it's film taking on the pirates. Although I don't think people suffer from piracy the same as they they did with Netflix and these subscription services. But basically, hang on a sec. I'm just going to quickly move to another place. It's getting quite loud in my house. No worries. Um, so, so basically, what Film Ahoy is is um, is a non-subscription service where people can watch films for free, um, but then um, there's commercial breaks every 20 minutes, but they only last two minutes long. So the idea was to not have um, long commercial breaks that really make it boring for the consumer. They, you can't fast forward through the commercials, but those... Commercials basically generate the revenue for the film. So, um, you know, you could probably get in a 90 minute film about 20 cents out of the, um, the viewing. And then it's about higher volume. So if you can get loads of people going on there, 
watching your film for free, but then you're getting 20 cents a time. You know, it can add up if you're getting 100,000 views or, or so on. Um, but then if they don't want to watch the film with commercials, because, you know, that they see it's a quality movie and, you know, they don't see the point of sitting there and watching commercials, then they can pay what is in our country a pound, so it's probably about $1.20, and then you watch it commercial-free. Um, and then all revenues basically split 50-50 with a filmmaker. Um, we've got about 150 to 200 films to go live with. Um, I'm probably going to lo- go live in January. And um, I just see it as a, like a secondary market. I still say, do your iTunes and, and Amazon and, and all the other platforms first where you can get your, your, your top prices for when you launch your film. But then... Mm-hmm. You know, something like Film Ahoy at this point could be a secondary market where you could start seeing revenue coming in. And, and eventually the idea is that we also, because I'm a producer, that I will produce content specifically for that. And having obviously had all the stats and figures of the site, I know what, what sort of revenue they can generate. So that gives me an idea on how much I can be making my films for and how much mm-hmm. I know I can get a return. So, yeah. so that that's that's just a way that I'm looking at going forwards now, and um, you know, there's no guarantee it's going to work. But every time you make a film, you've got a brand there that you have to get out to the market and and get everyone to to to, to watch your film. So, I just thought, why not do it for a platform where I can give loads of other filmmakers a chance to 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 generate some revenue. Plus, obviously, I can make some money at that, but also gives me another market to, to put my films mm-hmm. um so that and that's literally yeah. it's literally going to be filmahoy.com that's correct yeah okay perfect yeah i'll get that and i'll put that in the show notes as well so well dean this has been a great interview lots of great information um I think thank you sorry if i've gone on too long i apologize about that no, 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 not at all. So as I said, these sorts of conversations, I find them interesting. And um, and I know the listeners of this will too. Um, it's just really some insight um, into the workings of a real producer. So um, I really appreciate it. No, that's okay. Well, just one other thing I was going to say is sure. um, one thing I have noticed uh, and a big change is the, the change between films and TV. Mm-hmm. And probably most screenwriters now probably want to write a TV series where before it was just a feature film. I don't mm-hmm. know, you're, you're very much a feature film screenwriter, but how much do you now do as a, as a TV screen? Yeah, you know, and, and I've had this conversation with other people. I, you know, I run a script analysis service, so I see what, what people are writing and submitting, and truthfully, it's still mostly features. Now, maybe some of that is um, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because I'm sort of geared towards features, so maybe most of my listeners are more geared towards features, but yeah. I still see it's predominantly feature films that people are writing, at least through my script analysis service. Um, but um, but I hear I hear that what you're saying as well. No, um, and, and to be honest, I, I've spent also I've been stuck in my ways in a way, and, and um, you know spent 20 years really just focus on the, well first of all short films and feature films, mm-hmm. and I where do I start on TV? You know who do I go to to get that mm-hmm. deal? But but you can't ignore it because the, the money's falling out of films at the moment, mm-hmm. and yeah. and so everyone's moving to TV. Because you, you obviously, I, I believe the quality you, you, you get from making feature films should be transferable to, to TV. And, and the stuff you're seeing now on Netflix, like the Crown, $16 million an episode, and it looks phenomenal. It yeah, really yeah. does. So, yeah, and HBO uh, with Westworld and these things. I mean, these are high production value stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, but I suppose as a screenwriter, uh, and a bit of advice would, you know, maybe not just rely on writing feature scripts, mm-hmm. write a few series as well. And, and to be honest, I, I should be looking out for that more. You know, um, I, I know I'm busy making film after film at the moment, mm-hmm. but really I should be switched on to, to looking at series because you never know. I know it's a hard market and, and uh, you know, I understand from my little knowledge about TV, they're always looking for the season writer, the one that everyone's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe... Feature films is a way where you can get noticed to um, to them go into TV mm-hmm. because that's where the money is at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, you know, I, I would definitely be looking out for a TV series. So, you know, that, that's that's probably something, uh, some advice to writers that 
you know, write probably equal amounts of, of TV series as well as your feature films. First feature. So yeah, sound advice for sure. Well, Dean, again, I really appreciate this. Um, good luck with the Bromley boys and good Thank luck you. with um, with all your other projects. Thank you. Take care. I'll catch Perfect. up with you soon. Cheers, Ashley. Take it easy. Right, bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation, of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on something from today's interview with Dean. I thought it was very telling that Dean's movie City Rats was the one that really kicked his career into gear. If you haven't already done so, check out Dean's IMDb page. I'll link to it in the show notes, but that will really give you some sense of sort of the full scope of what he's done over the last you know 10 or 12, 15 years. You'll notice the um, short films are on his IMDb page before City Rats, and you'll also notice that he did a film, Night Junkies, which we talked about. That was a feature film also before City Rats. So often filmmakers think that they just need that one clerks or Blair Witch Project, um, just that one hit and they'll just, you know, their career will just take off to the stratosphere. And while that can happen, and I hope it happens to you, it's very unusual. And sometimes it takes more than one film to kind of get things going. Sometimes it takes, you know, several films, a decade's worth of hard work to really get things going. Um, things don't always happen as quickly or as easily as they might for the Clerks or the Blair Witch Project filmmakers. Um, those are sort of anomalies, even though they're exciting, sexy stories. We talk about them. We mention them here. I am mentioning them on the podcast, um, you know, decades after they, they occurred because um, they are just sort of legendary stories. And, and we think that's how it really happens. But I think Dean's story is probably more typical. City Rats was, again, it was Dean's second feature film. Plus, my guess is you listening to this podcast have never heard of City Rats. Certainly before I had met Dean, it was not a film that was on my radar at all. So my point to all of this is that a film can be successful but still doesn't necessarily need to have the kind of success as a paranormal activity or some of these just real big you know, indie films that just really blow up. They can still get your career going even if they're not super big hits like A Paranormal Activity. It can be a much more modest hit and still move you further along the road of your screenwriting career. Also, I thought it might be interesting to give some background information on my relationship with Dean because I think it's um, really crucial to understanding sort of how screenwriting actually works. He is a producer. Obviously, I just you just listened to an interview f from him, and he's someone that I met through my own email and fax blast service. Never had met him, never had heard about him. He's on my list, and I just sent him cold query letters. I honestly don't know how many 
cold query letters I sent him before he responded to one. But the bottom line is he eventually did respond to one of my cold query letters, said, okay, fine, I'll read the script. He read the script. He liked it. He ended up optioning it. Um, he was never able to get it going. So I actually got the rights back, but um, we've stayed in touch. I mean, we got along um, during the option period. He was always very communicative to me, um, which is a lot more than I can say for a lot of producers, but he kind of just would keep me in the loop every few months. He would kind of just tell me how things were going. We just kind of got along just chatting. We had talked a couple times on Skype. Um, he gave me some real good advice when I was going through the pinch. I knew him. I, I would say um, I probably had met him maybe a year or so before I started working on the pinch. So I had some established relationship with him. And as I started to work on the pinch, just, you know, coincidentally, we might be on a Skype call talking about the other script and I would just mention the pitch. And again, he's an experienced producer. So he was able to just give me some just casual advice off the top of his head that was, was pretty helpful to me. So again, these relationships are, it's about establishing them and building them and um, just honestly getting to know someone, um, you know, as time goes on last year, just another example last year in 2017, he was actually in Santa Monica for American film market. I was actually at American film market, film market with the pinch trying to sell that he was there trying to sell his film Bromley boys. Um, and you know, we made an effort to meet up and have breakfast. There's nothing like an in-person meeting to really just, you know, meet someone and, and get a real feel for them. Um, there's nothing better than an in-person meeting. So again, he made an effort to make himself available to meet for breakfast. I made an effort to meet him and um, again the relationship just got pushed a little bit further down the road you know is Dean ever going to produce one of my scripts you know who knows but it's a professional relationship and he's um, he's a good example of someone um, who you want to get to know um, he's a real producer he's producing movies um, he's not you know at the highest level where he's only looking at scripts from CAA and the top agencies. I mean, he has to be a little bit scrappier to find his material. Um, and those are the people you want to get to know as a screenwriter. He's a real producer. He's working, he's producing movies. Um, and that's the sort of relationships that, that you want to establish. And again, these relationships can take years before you see maybe any real fruits from it. Um, but Again, there's a lot more to these relationships than just selling a script. And I think that's what a lot of times screenwriters miss. As I said, he was able to give me some advice on the pinch. As I start to ramp up on my next project, I'm sure he'll be available, at least an email, maybe an occasional Skype call. He'll be available to help me on that. So there's a lot of sort of very um, sort of subtle, nuanced things that you might get out of the relationship in addition to just, did he buy your script? Did he produce your script? Um, so again, really think about these relationships in sort of the 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 whole with with a, with a taking a, a long view of these things, and it's not going to necessarily happen overnight. Um, I, the script I originally optioned to him, it was my female driven thriller script, um, and I optioned it to him a couple of times over the years. Um, and I think it was probably like maybe four years ago, three, four years ago um, when I first met him. So again, these things can take time um, as things develop. Um, and again, just that's the kind of relationship you want to get. I get a lot of people emailing me about my email and fax by service and they always say stuff, well, well, how many scripts have been optioned? How many scripts have been sold? And there certainly are examples of people optioning and selling scripts, but I think this is a better example of what you can really hope to get out of an email or fax blast or any of these services, Ink Tip, The Blacklist, any of these services, Virtual Pitch Fest, any of these services you're using. Yes, there's always a chance you might just get that option, get that sale and get that produced credit. That's best case scenario. But even if that doesn't happen, you can still build relationships with producers that can still bear fruit, you know, months and years and maybe decades into the future. Um, so again, really take a long view of this. Anyway, the script that I originally optioned to Dean, it was my female driven thriller script and I've optioned it a few times over the years. In fact, the first time I optioned it was right around the first time, was right around maybe September, October when I started the podcast in 2013 because I remember it was the first option I ever talked about and it was actually not the option to Dean, it was actually to another producer. She was not able to get it going. Then I optioned it to Dean and he was not able to get it going and then I have since optioned it to yet another producer um, who I met on Inktip. So it's still 
still out there, still getting pitched. So while I'm not overly confident that this new producer will get it produced, um, at least someone has it and is trying to get it made. Now, just to be clear, and this is going to be a reoccurring theme with my recap this year, the option for the script, this female-driven thriller script, it actually expired with this producer I met on Inktip, this new producer I met on Inktip, it actually expired in March. Um, but I have this sort of verbal agreement with this producer not to do anything with the script without kind of checking in with her first and kind of giving her like a first look at, at this. So if someone else is interested, I'll go back to her and kind of say, hey, you know, I've got this other interest. Where are you at with the project? And then she can kind of decide whether she's ready to move forward with it or not. And this is pretty common. Oftentimes, options end. And I usually, when I sign the option agreement, I usually make sure that when the option expires, if a producer wants to continue the option, they usually have to pay me $500 or $1,000. And typically what happens is at the end of this six months, the producer hasn't gotten the project going and they don't want to pay that $500 or $1,000, which is fine because what it means is, is that now we have to renegotiate everything. They can pay the money and then they can get that extension. So if they feel like they're close to getting the movie made, fantastic. Just pay me the money, keep the option going. If they're kind of still, you know, taking shots in the dark, sort of pushing the script around, they're not that confident, they're not going to want to pay the $500 or $1,000, whatever you can negotiate. Um, and so then it becomes this negotiation back and I can say, well, no, thanks. I don't want to continue on with you. Or I can say, sure, let's do another free option. Or I can just say, hey, no, you got to do the $500. Um, and, you know, with this case of this producer that has it now, I like her and she seems to be working hard on the project. So I'm fine. You know, don't worry about it. She actually did do one $500 extension. And then the second extension, I think I let her go for free. In the case of Dean, Dean had the project. It was the same thing. I think I gave him a free six month option and um, he came back to me after six months. He had a couple other ideas of places he could send the script. He didn't want to pay the $500 and I didn't really have a problem with that. Again, that was part of just forming this relationship with Dean. I wasn't going to like try and put the screws to him or make it argumentative or confrontational. I felt like he was doing a good job. I know he's a legitimate producer, so it was totally fine. I just re-signed the um, option agreement. He's a little more sophisticated than this current producer, and so he didn't want to have a sort of non-exclusive verbal agreement. He wanted another signed option agreement, and again, that was fine because, um, because again, I, I had met him and talked with him and, and liked just sort of the direction that he was going with the project, so I did give him an extra um, free six-month option. That eventually did end, and um, and that's about the time that I met this new producer. And I think Dean would have actually taken the, the option for another six months. But I just told him honestly, I said, hey, I got another producer who's interested in taking it. And um, I'm just going to let her take a, take a spin at it. And, um, you know, he was okay with that. Um, I think he probably could have paid the $500 and gotten a renewal. But, you know, it, it gave me a good sense of how serious he was. He wasn't willing to pay the $500. So, you know, he had had it for a year. And I think that's enough time to, um, to kind of, for him to kind of vet his, his contact and his financing sources and see where it was. So I didn't have a problem after giving him basically a free option for a year, moving it over to this other producer um, who has it now. So that's kind of the first piece of this 2000 recap, my female driven um, thriller. It's still kind of optioned in sort of a non-exclusive way, still moving forward. Again, this producer is doing a lot of work on it, so I know she is trying to get it going. Um, and I think her plan is actually to, to re-option it um, at some point um, in the near future. Certainly if I start to send it out or if I wanted to push her a little bit, certainly she would. But um, I'm kind of okay with how things are now. So that's my female-driven thriller. My baseball comedy that I've been talking about for years on this podcast is sort of in a similar spot. The producer still has it and is still trying to get it made, but that option allows lapsed. Um, I think I might have actually lapsed last June or July. Um, but again, we're still sort of basically with the producer. We have this sort of verbal, non-exclusive agreement. Um, in his case, he's paid us several $500 payments over the years because he's had the script for a number of years. Um, I think there's at least two $500 payments over the years. Maybe there's more than that. I honestly don't even remember. But he's had the script for a number of years. In fact, he's I met him before I started the podcast. So it's been more than five years he's been working on this um, on this, um, on this this project. And, and again, he's just a guy... I like him as a producer. In this case, it's a script I wrote with a writing partner. Both me and my writing partner like this producer. And so we're willing to just keep rolling the dice with this guy. Um, I've got enough other material that I can kind of always send stuff out. And the fact of the matter is if I see something on Ink Tip or if I meet a producer that's really looking for something specific, I can send him this baseball comedy as well. Because um, again, it's not 
optioned in sort of the traditional sense. I'm not going to really like mass market it and really push it out there as long as this producer is doing it. But if I meet someone who's just, oh, we were looking for a you know minor league baseball script with a you know a, an actor in this thus and such age range, and if my script is perfect, of course I'm going to submit it and um, and see what's what what I can possibly do with it on that front. And I can go back to this producer and say, listen, I found this other guy. He's serious. He's ready to go. And um, and, and part ways with this other producer. So again, these are sort of non-exclusive um, verbal option agreements. And we have these old option agreements in place that we can just re-sign and redate. Um, so it's not that hard to get it going if, if one or both of us want to do that. I'd say the big career milestone for me this year was selling my teen comedy, Josh Taylor's Prom Date. That's also written with a co-writer, Nathan Ives, who I also wrote the baseball comedy with, um, written a number of scripts with him over the years. So we did, we sold that script. It was actually shot last August. So it it's in post-production, so that's fantastic. It's another one where the option lapsed for me years ago, um, but again, my writing partner on the project, um, we both kind of like this producer, so we just sort of kept this loose, non-exclusive semi-option going. And again, I think it's been like four years. I know I optioned the script to him before I started the podcast. Um, and the reason I can remember this is because I physically moved um, from one house to another. I started the podcast um, when I had been living in my current home um, for about two months. Um, and I know I've been living here for five years. And I, I remember when we were doing the option, I was in my old house. Um, so that's in excess of five years when we first started that option agreement. Um, I don't remember when it expired. It might have expired three years ago or something. But um, certainly the beginnings the beginning options were, as I said, over five years ago. Um, but again, we stuck with the producer and he eventually raised the money and went out and shot the movie. And I, again, this is, in my opinion, this is kind of an example of this strategy that I'm taking actually working. If we had made him pay, you know, five hundred a thousand dollars every six months to keep the option going, I don't know that he would have done it. Um, I think there were some real moments where he basically kind of just lost interest in in the project altogether. He would get, you know, depressed or frustrated that he wasn't able to raise the money and things. And if he had hit, had to pay one of those five hundred dollar or thousand uh, reoptions during that period, I don't know that he would have done it. You never know for sure, but I just, I, that's my sense. So again, he's a guy that me and my writing partner like, so we just stuck with him and lo and behold, he raised the money and shot the movie. I also wrote a short animated TV pilot on spec this year, and I optioned that to another producer. And it's another producer like Dean, who I've optioned a bunch of projects for, met him through my email and fax class, but I have a real good working relationship with him. So I didn't even really send that script out. I just knew that he might be interested in it, went to him, and sure enough, he was read it and liked it and, and optioned it. Um, I don't have high hopes. I think he's very busy. He's got a number of other projects going. I think he had a couple of sort of avenues to pursue this animated um, TV pilot and um, I haven't heard from him in, in a couple months so I need to follow up with him but um, I just have a feeling that's probably not going to go anywhere but you know who knows but that will be the script probably that I really try and push in 2019 because um, that option I had with him will probably expire um, within the next couple of weeks and I'll have a like a frank conversation I'm good enough friends with him at this point to have an honest conversation with him if he's not doing anything with it he'll just be fine with me sending it out to other people um, so again, that one's um, sort of loosely optioned and, and hopefully moving along, but I don't have high hopes for it. If you remember too, this past year, I was working on a script for um, Las Vegas performer Gregory Popovich, no relation to the San Antonio Spurs coach, but he has a Vegas show. It's a kid's animal show, ma or um, not magic, but like juggling and clowning um, and, and animals, trained animals, dogs, trained dogs and cats. And um, he has this Vegas show and he also tours around the country. Um, I wrote a script sort of around that and um we did find I found a producer slash lit manager who liked the material and is interested in it. He wanted a number of rewrites done on the project before he was willing to send it out to his contacts, um, and they were all good stuff. He's a really smart guy, a good good. Um, he's a good literary manager and he's a good producer. Um, but I just never had the time to do these rewrites. They were they were smart. His, his ideas were good, and I I didn't disagree with them. But I just never got the time. And eventually, we were able to cut a deal where basically he's going to have one of his. Um, um, clients, writer clients, do the rewrites, and then um, maybe I'll be on as a writer if the show ever gets picked up. But I'll definitely be on as an executive producer. Just have some, um, some you know, f contact or some. Um, I'll be able to work on the project at least to some degree. Um, but this worked out fine because then I didn't have to spend the time doing the rewrites. Um, it's still sort of out there and and, and moving. Um, I need to tease another one I haven't heard from in a couple months, so I need to follow up with him. 
um, and just just see what's going on with that. I probably need to spend more time trying to get stuff optioned this year. The last couple of years, I've been maybe a little slack on this. I haven't done a lot of the blast for myself. I haven't maybe written as much material just because I've been spending it on the pinch. And now I'm kind of spending, um, I mean, the last really two years have been spent a lot on the pinch. Um, and then I'm actually starting to, to gear up for my next own writer, director, production, um, which is a horror thriller script. I've been talking about that over the last couple of weeks on the podcast. And I actually did finish a draft of that last week. So now I'm just polishing up that draft and going to send that out for notes. And hopefully we'll have a lock script here in the next couple of weeks or month or so. Then the other thing that happened was a script I wrote a few years ago called Snake Out of Compton. Um, that actually was produced and is now released. It was probably produced probably right along with the pinch but it now was released. They had their release in September. So that was released. And, um, that's great. If you have a moment, definitely check that out. They're doing a good job with the release. So it's available on all the normal sources. I'm not sure if it's got on Netflix yet, but it's on Amazon and, and iTunes and all that sort of stuff. So if you're interested in checking that out, definitely do. It's called Snake Out of Compton. Um, it's one where I was hired to write the first draft of the script. Then they ended up hiring a director. The director came on with his writing friends and they Co they rewrote the script. Um, so a lot of it isn't my writing, but hey, it is a produced credit. So it's always good to get a produced credit, but I'm not honestly, I've never seen the movie, so I'm not sure how much of it is mine or not. So all in all, two films, The Pinch and Snake Out of Compton were both released this year, finished and released this year. So that's great. Josh Taylor's Prom Date was, um, was produced. So a few other small options still floating around there. It's, it's, it's funny because when I sit back and do this recap, like I really hadn't done a recap in my own mind until I sat down and kind of, you know, outlined what I was going to say on this podcast today. And when I sit back and think about all this, um, it seems like a decent year for me as a screenwriter. I mean, certainly over the last 20 years I've been doing this, um, that's a pretty good year. One sold script, two, two movies released. Um, I can't complain. Um, but you know, it's just, it's, it's it like, again, taking a step back and looking at it, it says, Hey, it's not a bad year, but um, it never feels like a great year is all I can say. Um, and I just sort of share my, my feelings on this and, and hopefully they'll be help, helpful. You know, for example, with the pinch, you know, sales are pretty, pretty sluggish. Um, now that it's been being released, um, you know, it's becoming clearer and clearer, like it won't even come close to recouping the money that's in it. Um, and I knew this going into it, so it's not surprising, um, but it's still just a little bit disappointing. You know, with Snake out of Compton, I've never, as I mentioned, I've never seen the finished film at one point. Um, the the producers I noticed on IMDb they didn't give me a writing credit they gave me like a characters by credit or something some strange kind of a credit and um, I went back to them and said hey guys you know my contract actually says that I'm supposed to get writing credit on this so they did change it on IMDb but this was about a month before the film was released and um, but they wouldn't show me the film like they wouldn't actually show me a cut of the film and I suspect it's because they had forgotten to give me credit in the actual credits of the film um, which my contract actually mandated. So maybe they were afraid of upsetting me with that. But again, they never sent me a link to the film. I never actually saw it. I'm not really worried about it, frankly, if my credit is not on the actual finished film, because, um, you know, most people are not going to see Snake out of Compton, but they will look at IMDb. So really, at the end of the day, the credit, the value of the credit is being on IMDb. But again, it just puts a little bit of a black cloud kind of over the whole project and sort of my involvement with it. With Josh Taylor's prom date, my writing partner are still negotiating on the final contract since the option had expired long ago. We didn't actually have a purchase agreement in place. It sounds like it's all going to get worked out, which is fine. But again, it just sort of feels a little odd. Um, it makes the whole thing just a little more unpleasant than it should. Um, it just was very odd basically for this producer to go shoot the movie without having a contract in place. I mean, I didn't know him that well. Me and my writing partner at one point weren't sure if he was just planning on never going to pay us. Um, he had the script and he was just going to shoot it. We never really thought that because again, on IMDb, he was giving us credit and that sort of stuff. So he wasn't trying to hide the fact that we were the writers on the project, but he just didn't send us the check. I mean, the, any writing agreement says that basically the writer has to get paid the first day of principal photography at the latest. Um, and that did not happen. Um, so again, it just made it a little bit more unpleasant than it should have been. It's all getting worked out. So that's good. But, um, 
just never quite goes as smoothly as you might want it. And I'm sharing all of this because I'm hoping it helps other people out there who are going through this. If you're optioning, if you're selling stuff, you know, it just, it's not always, it's always a little bumpier. And, um, you know, people like to talk about, oh, I sold this script and you never really hear the nitty gritty details that how they didn't get paid until after the movie was shot and they didn't, you know, it, they had to get their agent to go and threaten the company um, to get their money. And there's just, there's always a little backstory that you don't hear about. So I'm hopefully trying to just, just, tell some of that and and hopefully if you're going through this same situation um, know that you know that's kind of just par for the course as screenwriters um, yes the writing is part of it but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes along with it and if you're not yet to the point where you are optioning and selling scripts you know just go into it with your eyes open and realize that there still are many pitfalls ahead even after you option and sell that first script there's still a lot of work to be done and um, things will not always be rosy and that's fine um, you know just understand that's part of the process and, and hopefully we can all get through it together so that's it for 2018 I hope everyone listening had a good 2018 and I hope everyone has an even better 2019 good luck to everyone and thank you for listening <laughs>